Many of the speakers have uh, explicitly disavowed any intention to talk about whether religion is true, and I shall not depart from that, um, except to say that as a scientist, I find that question hugely interesting as compared, for example, with the question of whether religion fosters intolerance uh, or um, the, some of the other questions that, that have been talked about. I mean, if it is true that the entire universe was designed by a creative intelligence, that's got to be the most important fact in the whole of science. And so let's just not forget that that, that, that is what we're talking about. Um, however, I'm going to now turn to some of the issues that have been talked about at the conference. What is a religion? Because that's been given rise to a lot of um, pr problems. How does it evolve, which rather dominated the first day? And is it moral? Does it foster intolerance, etc.? Um, what is it? Well, you could list various things like be belief in a supernatural creator, um, strong faith, by which I mean belief without evidence, um, strong influence of authority, uh, revelation, and tradition, uh, belief handed down in families. And I think you could probably find awkward exceptions to most of those except tradition. For example, as we heard from Owen Flanagan, uh, not all um, beliefs that are thought to be religious um, include a supernatural element. Um, faith, well, you could probably say that Stalinism and Hitlerism depended on faith. Certainly in spades, they depended on authority, uh, a, a form of revelation probably. But tradition, beliefs handed down in families, that does seem to me to be probably uniquely characteristic of, of religion. Um, you would never hear anybody talk about a postmodernist child or a logical positivist child or an existentialist child. Um, uh, but yet everybody in our society essentially is perfectly happy to talk about a Catholic child or a Muslim child. And there's something very odd about that. It's similar to talking about a, an English child or a German child or a French child, which is obviously much easier to understand. But I think there is no other case where belief in a worldview, belief in a form of morality, belief in a form of cosmology, runs in families in quite that way. And, and I mean, it's, it's, of course it's true that there may be individual Marxists, say, who very much hope their children will take over their beliefs. But the rest of society doesn't buy that. The rest of society doesn't say, oh, that's a Marxist child. The, the, the father may, may, may hope the child will grow up a, Mar a Marxist, but, the, but in the case of religion, we buy into it. So that's my offering for an answer to the single most salient diagnostic feature of a religion. Turning now to um, the question that dominated day one, um, does religion have a Darwinian survival value? Has it been naturally selected? And I want to make two points here. Um, First is, are we focusing on the right phenotype? And I did make the point on, on, on day one. Um, it may be that religion, I mean, clearly we're, we're, we've got to look for something like a Darwinian explanation because, because religiosity is pretty much a human universal in the ordinary sense of the term. Um, however, it may be that we're asking the wrong question if we say, what's the Darwinian survival value of religion itself? It may be that what we should be doing, in fact, I think it's almost obvious that what we should be doing is we want to know what is it about the brain that genes actually work upon, because that's what natural selection is ultimately about. Um, and it's got to be something like psychological predispositions which manifest themselves in the form of religion under the right cultural conditions. So don't ask, what is the Darwinian survival value of religion? Ask what's the Darwinian survival value of psychological predispositions which tend to manifest themselves as religion under the right conditions. And the kind of things I'm thinking of there have been mentioned several times in various talks. Um, Roger Trigg, for example, mentioned the idea that children are um, natural dualists, uh, natural agency seekers um, had uh, that, 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 that idea, um, natural creationists. And to that I would add, um, following on perhaps some of the um, ideas that came out of Pat Churchland's talk, um, and, and I think others, um, natural soci socializers, natural um, in influenced by the need to, to make social contact. And that might lead to, when, when you move out from kin to kith, that might lead to um, 
gratitude dispensers, grudges, um, guilt feelers when you're not pulling your, playing your full role in, in society, that, that kind of thing. Any of those uh, nat natural conscience havers, conscience possessors, any of those things could feed into religion. Psychological predispositions could feed into, uh, into religion. And one that I've mentioned before um, is the tendency to obey authority, to particularly to believe what your parents tell you as a child. That, again, would be a psychological predisposition which might feed into uh, religiosity. I don't have time to go into any of those in, in detail. I could. Today, all I want to do is suggest that the Darwinian question should be leveled at um, what the genes might actually be influencing in the brain, not at religion itself. The next problem would be the, the Panglossian problem. Um, when we ask a sort of teleological question, in the case of ordinary biology, we know just what we mean when we resort, because we are natural teleologists, I suppose you could say. When we, we resort to teleological language, we know what we're doing. So when we say something like, birds have the problem when flying, the problem of stalling, and the solution they came up with was to have slots at the end of the, of the wing. Every Darwinian knows what they mean by that. They can translate that into proper Darwinian language if they want to. And we don't bother, because it's too tedious, because we are natural teleologists. We haven't got time to spell out the natural selection details in the way that perhaps sometimes we should. Um, but that's OK. Where it's not OK is when it's, it's, clear, it's not clear what kind of Darwinian selection, if any, we're talking about. And that a fortiori is true when we're talking about, about um, religion. It's just not obvious when you ask what's the Darwinian survival value of religion, what kind of selection you're talking about. Are you talking about genetic selection? In which case, what you have got to mean is that individuals who possess the quality you're interested in, religiosity or a psychological predisposition to it, um, are more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes. There's got to be genetic variance in, in, the, in the quality you're talking about. It's got to contribute to survival and or uh, reprodu and reproduction. And, and it could be, and that, that would be a perfectly respectable uh, idea to pursue. But when we're talking about, when we use a phrase like, um, uh, what's the advantage of something or other, if we suggest that um, terror management, say, um, it has, is, is a, is a, that, that, that religion has a buffering effect on terror management and makes us um, less likely to fear death. That is not a Darwinian explanation until you bridge the gap to say why it is that removing the fear of death or, or partially buffering against the fear of death actually contributes to survival and reproduction. Genetic tendencies to have a psychological predisposition not to fear death that's got to translate into gene survival. Otherwise, we're not talking Darwinism. And maybe it does, but I just want to call your attention to the need to spell that out and not hide behind a kind of, um, of uh, smokescreen of, of, of loose Darwinian thinking, which doesn't actually spell out the details. It doesn't have to be genetic selection. You could imagine other kinds of quasi-Darwinian process, uh, meme selection, the differential survival of ideas or rituals or something like that in a population of ideas or rituals which have no connection with genes necessarily, but yet might be subject to some kind of quasi-Darwinian selection and might therefore be um, subject to a kind of evolution. Or other people might like to consider the possibility of selection between whole systems of thought, differential survival of entire religions. Are some religions better at displacing other religions over wide geographical areas. That's not strict Darwinism. It sounds a bit like Darwinism. It's actually, I think, it's got more akin, more in common with um, ecological competition. I, I mentioned um, the distinct, the um, replacement of red squirrels by gray squirrels in this, in this country. That's not a Darwinian selection process. That's ecological competition. And you could say the same thing and in many historical examples where one kind of civilization, including a religion, uh, displaces another by, by conquest or by being superior in some sort of way in its ability to appeal. And finally, there's the possibility that religions might not be um, due to a Darwinian process at all, of, of any kind, not, not even a, close to, to it, but to intelligent design 
And this came up with, I think it was after Dominic Johnson's talk, um, the idea that um, uh, religions might actually be designed in the same kind of way as military procedures, military drills are designed to, um, to psychologically manipulate soldiers, uh, get them over the, the, their fear or get them over their reluctance to kill by specific procedures which are designed to have that effect. Um, right, that's all I wanted to say about uh, the Darwinian um, or, or, or the function, the biological function, shall we say, of, um, of religion. Um, now, the question of whether religions are good or bad, whether they, are, whether they are, have a good effect on the welfare of humanity, whether they are intolerant or tolerant and so on. Um, I, I, I'm sorry to put this in, but I, but I think because it came up once, religious apologists really do need to stop trotting out Hitler and Stalin as um, examples of the evils of, of, of atheism. That's, I, I would go so far as to say, positively mendacious. Um, Hitler and Stalin both had moustaches, <laughs> and so did Saddam Hussein. Nobody wants to claim that moustaches make you into a, an, an evil, murdering uh, dictator. You have got to do something better than just say, these, these men were, I mean, happened to be atheists, if, if indeed they, they were. Um, Hitler may or may not have been an atheist, but uh, what's absolutely sure is that um, the majority of his henchmen, of the people who carried out his orders, the ordinary foot soldiers, the Gestapo, the SS, they almost certainly were largely religious, either Catholic or, or Lutheran. Um, and um, we're not, I don't want to say that's why they did those horrible things either. I'm not doing that, that kind of thing. What we want to know is, I mean, you, you, you might ask where did the anti-Semitism come from? And um, Tony Cody very, very magnanimously acknowledged that a lot of that could have come from the Roman Catholic Church. And indeed, it could have come from Martin Luther, who was one of the great anti-Semites of history. Um, but I don't think we ought to be in the business of totting up the number of bad things that are done by uh, religious people and the number of bad things that are done by non-religious people, because it could have nothing to do with their religion or their or their non-religion. Um, you could do, you, you get a better result if you do proper statistical studies like uh, people like Dan Batson and, and Miles Houston are, are, are doing. Um, but I think that what we should be doing, if we're going to look at history at all, is to ask the question, not how many evil deeds are done by crusaders versus atheists or something like that, but whether there's any general reason why religious belief or lack of it, might provide a motive for doing horrible things. Is there any um, logical reason why somebody's religious belief or, la or lack of it might move them, might lead them to do something horrible? As uh, Sue Mendes suggested um, when talking about suicide bombers and such people, um, jihadists, the very least we might say is that we ought to not to ignore the possibility that when people like suicide bombers say they're motivated by religion, they might actually mean what they say. As Sam Harris has said about bin Laden and other jihadists, these people really believe what they say they believe. And some might deny that that has any, any significance. Um, uh, Sue Mendes quoted some people like Michael Ignatieff who deny that. Um, I think Scott Atron denies it. But at least prima facie, it sounds plausible and we ought to be looking. We ought to be uh, at least taking seriously the possibility that, as Sam Harris says, these people really believe what they say they believe and that's why they do the things that they do. There really is a plausible, logical pathway that could lead rational, intelligent, capable people, even good and righteous people, once they've been convinced of a, pre of a premise such as God wants me to kill infidels, say, those people, rational, intelligent, good, righteous people who sincerely believe that that's what their God wants them to do, that provides the logical pathway which will lead them to do it. And they will do it believing they're righteous, believing they're good, believing they're going to a martyr's heaven, and 
uh, and lots of other people who share the same religion believe it too. I could imagine a similar logical progression from a, a non-religious premise, uh, say a political ideology, a belief that the good of the party is paramount, something like that, that could very easily lead to similar murderous, um, indiscriminate um, evil. I cannot, on the face of it, imagine a logical progression to such violence flowing simply from atheism per se. It just doesn't have the plausible ring to it in the way that the premise, God wants me to kill, or the party wants me to kill. So I think that, that religious apologists need to concentrate not on counting the number of murders done by people of various persuasions who happen to be atheists or, or not, but rather ask whether there's any general reason why the beliefs in question should lead people to do these terrible diseases. I think, I think that there is, in the case of faith, faith which means belief in the absence of evidence, that faith really does have the potential to lead to terrible deeds. Of course it has the potential to lead to very good deeds as well. But uh, be because it's faith, because it doesn't have to answer to questioning, you don't have to, have to justify it. You say, well, that's my faith, end of story. It does have potentially dangerous possibilities in the hands of what may be only a tiny minority, but it only takes a tiny minority to do these things. And if a majority has taught, I, I hesitated, I didn't want to use the word indoctrinate, has taught children that faith is a virtue, that believing something without evidence, without question, that somehow you get more brownie points if you believe it without question, that although the majority of children trained in that way are not going to become suicide bombers, there is a logical pathway that will lead a minority to do so. And it's not such a small minority in some cases. Um, so, uh, to conclude, um, if there is a single defining feature of a religion, it's tradition, the assumption that children will inherit the beliefs of their parents, and that it's right for us as a society to label children with the beliefs of their, of their parents. Um, if there is a single dangerous feature of religion, it is faith, uh, which is belief in the absence of evidence. I'll stop there. Thank you.